So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining me today for our workshop. So welcome to getting started with comparing and annotating digital images, an introduction to IIIF and Mirador. And I've actually decided to break this workshop up into uh, part one and part two. So part one will be today and you'll be hearing about part two as well and what will be included in part two. Um, so again, while everyone is getting settled, I'm gonna drop one more time in the chat, the uh, workshop survey and the slides for today. I try to keep things as accessible as possible. So my slides contain all my notes of everything I'm going to say and cover during today's workshop. So take advantage of that if it's useful to you. Um, and while you're checking that out, let me introduce myself. Um, I'm Dr. Francesca Albrezzi. I'm a digital research consultant at the Office of Advanced Research Computing here at UCLA. And I work closely with the Institute for Digital Research and Education. Um, I also lecture in the DH program, the Digital Humanities program, as well as in the Department of World Arts and Cultures on occasion. My background is in art history and American studies. Uh, and I've spent about 10 years uh, in and out of museums. So working at places like Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Smithsonian, um, and the Getty Research Institute here in LA. My dissertation looked at immersive technologies in museums and cultural heritage. So if you're interested in any kind of extended reality technologies, whether it's virtual reality, augmented reality, uh, mixed reality of any kind, I've given some workshops on that in the past and we're always developing more resources. So please let me know if you have any questions about that at any point. Um, and with that, Let's jump into today's workshop. So today we're here to talk about uh, digital images. And I'm gonna just quickly turn off my camera so we can focus on the slides. So as many of you probably know, the first photo was uploaded to the web in 1992 by Tim Berners-Lee, pictured here on the left. Uh, and as Computer speeds and internet bandwidth have increased over the years. Digitization initiatives have multiplied exponentially. Uh, the Digital Art History Journal is publishing a new edition series tomorrow, and it, it's entirely focused on the digital image as a central component to knowledge building and preservation, um, specifically looking at 12 projects that span various disciplines and cultures. So definitely check that out when it's released tomorrow. For more context about the critical issues surrounding digital image methods, it doesn't, um, I don't believe it specifically addresses Mirador, which is what we're gonna be looking at today or IIIF, um, but it does kind of give a broader concept to the, to the landscape and history of digital images. So IIIF, or as you can see here, IIIF, which stands for the International Image Oper uh, Interoperability Framework, uh, often referred to as IIIF, is a set of uh, APIs or application programming interfaces um, specifications that are useful for accessing images on the web. Basically, when GLAM institutions, um, GLAM standing for Gallery, Library, Archive, and Museum Institutions, first started to digitize and share their collections, they were using all different types of platforms, formats, metadata types, et cetera. And if you were a researcher trying to create a collection or database for your own research, it was really difficult to bring this information together in an easy, cohesive way because things wouldn't map from one thing to another. Uh, so in 2011, a consortium of seven international institutions came together to form a standardized method for describing and delivering images over the web as well as related metadata about structured sequences of images. So with hundreds of adopters now from all around the world, there are um, more than a billion digital objects that exist as IIIF compliant content, which is really exciting for those of us working in the digital image realm. 
So some of this content that I'm going to share with you today is from um, Benjamin Alperton of Stanford University Library. Uh, he's the Stanford University Library is one of the founding institutions of IIIF, so they are really the experts over there. <laughs> uh, he did a set of webinars in 2020 for the Bibliographical Society of America. And while some of the APIs have been updated, much of this foundational stuff is the same or similar. So because of this, we're going to work from some of a few of the resources he shared. And I'm also placing this YouTube link and resource link for his uh, work in my slide notes. So feel free to check those out uh, after today's workshop. Um, but with that, let's get started. So from, uh, for me, seeing is believing. So I'm going to place a link in the chat to a resource developed by Jack Reed. You should get that now in your chat, um, which uses the image API from IIIF to allow us to manipulate an image on the fly. Um, as the documentation states, the, this API was conceived of to facilitate systemic reuse of image resources in digital image repositories maintained by cultural heritage organizations. It could be adopted by any image repository or service and can be used to re um, retrieve static images in response to a properly constructed URI. I'm going to show you what that means in just a minute. So. Um, this is all directly from IIIF's own most recent version 3.0 documentation. Um, but this construction looks like a link that allows you, which you can see it here, this is the construction and these are the breakdowns of, of what that schematic of that um, construction looks like. Um, and basically it allows you to specify the region, the size, the rotation, quality, characteristics, and format of the requested image. So you get all these kinds of different options here. So let's try a few adjustments ourselves to highlight things in actions. I'm just gonna switch back and forth between um, a, our slides and doing it live for you. So, the first thing we'll do is we'll change the size to 10, then we'll try adjusting the rotation to 90, and then we'll set the range rather than uh, these coordinates, we'll actually set it to full so we can see the entire picture. So let's give that a, a try for ourselves. So if you head over here into this playground, right, we can adjust this to 10 and our, we see our image gets really, really small. Um, we can shift the rotation to 90, and we see that we've rotated the image. And then finally, we can maybe set this back to zero and set the region to full to see the full picture. And now we can see the context for where Martin Luther King was in this image. So what we have just been doing is changing the request parameters that we are making of the image server where the image is hosted. And the image itself isn't changing at all, actually. The only thing that we are changing is how it appears on the web to us. So moving right along then, let's do one more exercise with the image, um, IIIF image API, so we can get a handle on this. So say you wanna crop an image and maybe export it as a different file type. So you have it downloaded on your own computer. Here's another tool that takes advantage of the IIIF image API. I'm going to copy and paste this into the chat so that everyone can try it with me. Uh, with this WYSIWYG editor, or um, WYSIWYG stands for what you see is what you get, you can drag and select which area of the image you um, want, and you can make a selection to what type of format you want to save as. So we can see that we can focus on different things in this um, photo. We can adjust it to make sure that we're getting all the kids. 
right? Maybe we just want this, we don't want the top section. And then we can change the select output, how, how uh, many pixels we want it to be, so the resolution. Um, we can also, in this case, change it to a PNG, which is a higher um, image type, or a GIF, or something that's set for web publishing. Um, we can also adjust the image if we wanted it to be rotated uh, 90 degrees, 120 degrees, right, on output. Um, and then what we can do is we can preview that image. Right, so we can see that that top part has been cut off. And we can download this image if we wish. So this gives us this URL and we can right click here and save as if we wanna save the image to our own desktop. Um, now what we're going to do is take what we learned from the last tool and apply it to this one. So if we want to switch the image um, that we're working on, we're going to adjust the link at the top, this link at the very top here. And that'll allow us where it says image ID, we know that it's looking for the URI structure that we just played with. So we're going to adjust it to point to the photo of the Stanford collection that we were just working with. So I'm gonna, you can go back here and you can copy it from here, or I have it copied in our notes, so either way. What we're gonna do is we're after it says image ID, we're just gonna highlight that, delete it, and replace it with that Stanford URI. And now we see that we have the Martin Luther King image. So in this case, we don't need the info about the characteristics because that's going to be set within the tool that we have below. And we just want the bit through the identifier. Um, and we're gonna stop at that, that section before the region. So I should have mentioned that. So in this link, right, we actually don't want everything after full. So we just want from here to here. So we just want through the identifier. We don't need the region size, rotation, quality, right? So that's what we added. And that's how we got this image here. So then we can select the section you want. And notice that our file type is now limited to JPEG. That's likely because that is the only file option that they have for that image on the image server. We can preview the image again, and, and then we can download it if we want to. So just like we did before, right? We can preview it. And then we can download that, right? Copy, save as. Um, and when we download it, we get a new window with that image and you can, you can now use that URI link up at the top or you can click the right to save as, right? And download that image to the computer. So you have those two options. So as any researcher- I'm sorry, I have a question. Oh yes, please. Yeah, so does this only work for uh, images that are public domain? So what kind of images can you use for the, in this kind of tool? Is yeah. That, is that what you're asking? So they have to be triple IF compatible images. And I'm uh, just gonna get to in just a minute here after we talk about the presentation API, how you find and locate um, triple IF compliant images. Okay, thank you. Of course, a great question. You're, you're exactly on track, you know where we're headed. <laughs> so, um, as any researcher knows who's worked with visual materials, adjusting the images are just step one and step two is presenting them in a meaningful way. Um, that's where the IIIF presentation API comes into play. Both the image API uh, and the presentation image uh, and the presentation API are written in JSON or JavaScript object notation, which is fairly readable. Um, as a, a data interchange format. And this is what allows 
for the standardized description of a collection of images in terms of their structure, layout, and presentation. The presentation API allows for collections to be formed as, and for compound items to be made. So for example, you see on the right here, a 15th century book of hours, which is a Catholic prayer book from France. And when a library is preparing this manuscript for digitization, they are taking pictures of each folio or page, uh, which you can see in the left-hand menu right here, right? Um, now, if I switch the book view to book view so that the folios are side by side rather than individual like this, and we can actually, let's see, open this up and take a look at it for ourselves. So this is actually um, the universal viewer, which is also a IIIF viewing tool. It's a, not the one that we'll cover today. We're going to be looking at Mirador. Um, but there's a couple different options here for viewing. So this is the side-by-side -side view, right? Rather than the single view, the single view you can select this way. And then this gives you the two pages side-by-side. Um, and that rearrangement can happen seamlessly because the image data is structured in a way that allows for all these images to be understood uh, and read as a collection. And that certain pages are connected to other pages so that they can display properly based on our settings. Uh, this is further complicated when we add in annotations. And I'm going to just switch back to our slides here so you can start to look at this graphic over here on the left, which gives you some insight. Um, so this is further complicated when we add annotations, as you can see here, um, which becomes additional connected data structures on top. And the documentation for the presentation API is a bit lengthy, which is linked to here. Um, and I've linked to the latest version. But this diagram demonstrates how the units of the presentation API link up. So most of the time as users, we'll be dealing with the front end because um, this can get a little hairy in the, in the back end, but I want you to be aware of these JSON structures because when we start to move things around to compare, they'll actually become quite important. So with that, What's most important here is to note how with IIIF, a paradigm shift, oh, there we go. A paradigm shift is happening in terms of methodology where we are moving away from having, uh, having to access content through portals to having uh, portal, portable digital objects that you can work with yourselves in different environments, which is really useful. Now we're gonna dive into making use of those presentation APIs, specifically Mirador, which is one of several um, IIIF image viewers. For example, there's also what I just was talking about and showcasing um, in, Oh, this book of hours, right? That's the universal viewer. And that can actually handle 3D content um, if it's set up to do so. But Mirador allows you to view, compare, and manipulate images specifically. It also can allow you to annotate, display those annotations, and complete trans uh, transcriptions uh, if the installation is set up to do so. so if everyone would join me at projectmirador.org, I'm going to head over together. I'll drop them in the chat. Okay. So we're going to start with um, the live demo. So you're going to click. Try a live demo. And we're going to start to play around. So let me quickly just go over some of the functionality 
here. So Mirador just switched over from version two to version three. So all of this is fairly new. Um, so that's why I wanna go over it together right now. The menu on the left um, controls the instance of Mirador. So these are your sort of overarching controls here on the left. And the plus button is where you can add an additional resource or collection to the Mirador viewer. So let's demo this live. Uh, if you like, you can add one or more and then a third window will appear in the workspace. So let's uh, try that out now for ourselves. And we can click on something and that shows up now as a third window. Uh, the little bookmark icon that we see here keeps track of how many viewing windows you have open and allows you to toggle between them. So if I click on it, you'll see it gives me the options of the different windows. And depending on how many windows you open at once, that can be really useful just for being able to find the thing you're looking for. Um, but this is also handy if you don't click on the top menu bar of the viewing window to jump between windows. Um, if, you, if you don't click, you can see it, it highlights blue to, to let you know which one you're in. Um, but if you're toggling between them and you ac accidentally just click on the image itself, it can zoom in and out, even if you're not clicking directly on the image. So that's why it's really useful to use this toggle because um, then you can just select which one you want to navigate to without actually uh, interacting with the image itself and adjusting the zoom in inadvertently. The gear icon lets you access your workspace settings. So right here. And this will show you um, or let you toggle on um, or off. So hide or um, show your zoom controls. You can also select your workspace type. So in this case, the default type is mosaic, which lets you move and size your windows in relation to each other within the visible frame automatically. Alternatively, you can switch to elastic, which allows you to move and size windows freely and in a limited workspace. So in this option, windows can overlap or layer on top of one another. But note, if you switch, it will start a new workspace for you. So keep that in mind. Like if I were to switch now, it would totally, um, sort of restart this whole workspace. So I'm not gonna do it now, but you can, you can test those out for yourself. Um, workspace options, which is next here, these little dots across, allows you to, um, oh, I actually, did I cover all of the things here? No, I, I forgot to mention there's language. So you can select the language that you're working in. Uh, you can also change the theme. So if you want to go between dark and light, some people prefer a dark background. It helps with contrast. So it's really up to you what type of um, background or theme you would like when you're working in Mirador. Um, so moving on to workspace options. This is probably what I would consider the most important functionality in this menu. It allows you to import and export the JSON of your workspace so that you can save it and transfer it or reinitialize it at another time. So if you go to export, you can actually see the JSON and you copy that and then be able to move that into another instance of Mirador, um, edit it, make adjustments, um, and then re-import it later on if you want to. So we'll, we'll go into more of that in a minute, but I just wanted you to become familiar with that. And then finally, the square icon is for going in and out of full screen mode. So if you want to be able to make this big or small, you can do that. Any questions about those uh, menu items? Uh, so does Mira Mirador let you upload your own images? Um, if you have a local instance, you can work with your own images, and we'll talk a little bit about that um, in the second half of our workshop today when we actually start working with our own, set up our own instance of Mirador in, our, in a website that we control. So when you're working with just a 
sort of general demo instance, either through an institution like the one we have here at UCLA, which I'll demo in a minute, um, or the one on the Mirador site, uh, you actually can't upload your own images, but in, in a local instance, you can work with your own images. So great question. Uh, so now let's focus on the window function um, and the, its functionality that runs horizontally across the top. Once you've loaded in a resource, so once you've got these resources loaded in, you'll have these menu options up at the top and we'll just quickly run through them together. So the hamburger menu here on the left, also known as the toggle sidebar, um, will provide you with essential metadata about the object and our collection, like the record information, um, which includes the IIIF uh, manifest link down here at the bottom. So just note that, because we'll be talking about that more um, and manifest links and their importance in a bit. Um, under this sidebar, you will also find rights for the particular image that you're looking at, an index if it's a collection, so the, the number of images that are contained within that particular resource, and uh, annotations if there are any. So there's also annotations here, we can see a number on this Van Gogh image. So the second icon is a square um, that lets you, um, or I should say this window lets you, uh, next is the book icon on the right side that will allow you to adjust your window and view, your window view and the thumbnail display. So these adjust depending on your resource. So for example, in this case, we can see a gallery view or a single view. Um, and we can have these thumbnails either off, take them away, right, if we don't want them. We can also shut down our annotations, and, or we can move them to the right if we prefer to scroll that way. Um, if, for example, we're looking at this particular resource, you'll see, right, we've got the gallery view. There's many more here. Um, let's try, let's see in this one. Let's try adding a resource where it shifts. One might be different. Oh, I know what we need. We need a book. Let's find a book. Let's try this one. So now we can see we have single book or gallery, right? So in depending on what kind of a resource you're looking at, this view structure will adjust um, and allow you to pick different views. Um, and then finally, the X closes. Now, now that my workspace is kind of full up, this X is really handy, right? So I can close things down. Um, oh, and I should mention too, the maximize window. So this maximize window uh, function allows you to pop up that particular resource, but it, when you pop it down, it actually saves the structure of your workspace so you can highlight or focus in on a particular resource without disrupting the overall structure of your workspace. Um, you can, too, drag and drop between these windows to uh, adjust depending on how you want to view that work. And again, when you export your workspace and re-import it in a different environment, right, if we had a, a separate instance, which we'll look at in a minute, that whole structure would be maintained. So everything would get imported in this way. So it's really useful. Questions about that? Okay. So remember how I said the IIIF manifest link was important? Well, here's why. 
that link is what allows us to pull IIIF resources into our workspaces from various institutions who are standardizing their digitized collections so that they are IIIF compliant. Uh, the other option is to look at the collection records or items within various institution repositories and drag and drop the IIIF logo into our workspace. So we have a couple of different ways that we can do this. Um, but as you can see, let's start with this book of hours here, right? We have this manifest URL here. Um, and I'm just going to drop this into the chat so everybody can play around with the same resource if they want to. Now, in our Mirador instance, right, if I wanted to add that particular item, I'm just going to pop out this window for a second to make it a little more apparent what I'm going to do here. So I'm going to take this book of hours manifest URL and I can either copy it. Um, so I can copy the image address, or I can simply drag and drop it. See how that plus sign shows up into my workspace. Yeah. Ah, I know what happened. So one of the things about these manifest URLs, as we had noted before, is that sometimes they need a little work to get them to add well. So if we click on the IIIF icon where it says manifest URL, it will open a new tab in our browser with the JSON for that resource. What we're looking for is the manifest ID for that resource. We see it here at the top, just after the at symbol, uh, where it says at ID, we know that, um, that that particular thing afterwards is the resource ID info that we need. So we are going to copy that URL that is in between those two single quotes. And then we're gonna go back to our instance of Mirador and place that URL in the add resource section. Now that we can see that book of hours resource in our Mirador instance, we can add it to our display if we want to. So now it's in the upper right hand corner and we can compare it with our other resources. Now I want us to backtrack here for a second to our Stanford resource. This was using an image API rather than a presentation API. And we can see that here in the JSON for the image which I got by adding info.json after the identifier information. So I can't bring it over um, in this format um, because it's not set up correctly for Mirador, which needs a presentation API. But if we go to the Stanford collections and we find that particular resource, um, I did so by searching Martin Luther King and March and scroll through to find the image that we were looking for. And I can find a version of that format that's done for Mirador from their collections database. So see how the identifier is the same, but the structure of the URL has changed. Then we can copy that manifest version of the URL for that resource and paste it into Mirador and then add that resource into our Mirador workspace. Now that we understand how to bring various kinds of resources into Mirador, let's try comparing um, a couple different resources in the environment. So bringing in several different ones and doing some comparisons. In this Google Doc that I'm gonna place in the chat, there are a number of options in here. There's a resource list that is going to allow us to bring in some resources. So this doc um, has repositories that have copies of Galileo's uh, Sidereus Nuncio 
Tunisius, which is a short astronomical treatise that was the first published scientific work based on observations made through a telescope, which is pretty cool. Um, so this document here um, will walk us through step-by-step step to make some comparisons across different versions. So uh, it's an exercise that again came from Benjamin and it's should be foolproof, so let's give it a try ourselves. Um, we can go to the Stanford Library's collection here, and we can see that they've got this IIIF resource all ready to go. And see how I, I uh, if you look at my URL down at the bottom, the URL that comes up down on the bottom, you can see it says manifest on the end of it. That's how we know it's probably gonna be compliant. We'll talk about the UCLA's um, work in just a minute here, and they're hoping to have uh, most of their collections are AAA um, Air Door 3 compliant already. So what we're going to do is we're going to drag and drop this resource over. So go back here and take this and drag and drop it over. See, it does work. <laughs> um, so we can bring in these various different types of this particular manuscript from different repositories into a single workspace to compare them. Um, if we go back to our document, let's try another. Um, maybe we wanna do one from the Smithsonian. And the Smithsonian has theirs within the Internet Archive. Now the Internet Archive has their links structured like this. And in my notes, I just wanna point out, in my notes here, I just wanna point out some tips and tricks. So for something like archive.org, they have some, adjustments that need to be made to their URLs, like I was trying to do before, specifically adding this manifest.json at the end of it in order for it to be compatible. So you also need to switch the archive.org slash detail to triplif.archivelab.org slash triplif before the identifier information. Um, so both the front and the back of the URL have to shift in order for this to then be compatible. Aha. But now we can bring that in and make the comparison so we can start to see these two documents next to one another. Um, what's really interesting is if we go to gallery view, right, we can get a sense of how they're different and also how they're the same. Um, this one's actually quite different. Um, may not be the same color. This particular case. But as you can see, you can bring in various different copies. And I did, that's why I said I did this earlier today. There were several different ones that I brought in. Um, so you can adjust the windows to your liking and take a screenshot and add it below with your comparison. So if you're following along and you're doing this yourself, uh, again, keep at this, these should work. I do wanna say that I mentioned at the very beginning of today's workshop that IIIF was founded so that interoperability would be possible. Obviously, um, when big switchovers like this happen, uh, issues arise, but let me give you an example of what these issues have been uh, so that it becomes clear why IIIF um, and their work is so critical. Um, this is an example of a Getty Research Institute special collection system um, called Rosetta, the Rosetta app. I'll bring it up here so you can see it live. They're using a different viewer, which works great. I mean, it's, it's really lovely. Um, gives you different options and you can zoom in and see high quality images in the same way that you would with Mirador. Um, 
but I would have to download these files and then upload to a, upload them to a personal image server. So I'd have to download them all myself um, and then upload them to a personal image server to bring them into Mirador. And these are larger files. So now suddenly I'm becoming personally responsible for paying for that hosting space rather than pointing to a set of items that are within a reputable institution. So do you sort of see the problem and why IIIF is solving a really big issue um, and allowing for sort of the burden of storage and also the responsibility of care to be with these major institutions instead of us as researchers. So the Getty Research Portal is a valuable uh, resource aggregator if you're not familiar with the Getty Research Portal. And we can see in their virtual collections that um, some are hosted in the internet archive. And in theory, we now know how to make those resources IIIF friendly, so that's a start. Again, I'm gonna try this just to see if I can bring it over. Um, so I wasn't having issues earlier today. We have these really beautiful manuscripts. And again here, when we see this URL at the top and we want to bring it, uh, bring this resource over into our Mirador environment, we copy that URL, but we do make those changes yet again to the front and the back of the URL. So we have to switch the front of the URL um, from archive.org to IIIF.archivelab.org slash IIIF, and then the universal or the identifier, which is that part that comes after the .org. And then we have to add at the very end of that the manifest.json, that slash manifest.json, so that we adjust the URL and we have the identifier information in between those two, uh, pre the prefix and the sort of suffix of, of that identifier. Um, so once we've shifted that info at the front and the back with that link, then we can bring it into our environment. The point is that when we're able to just simply drag and drop or use these URLs, we are not having to do the hosting ourselves. Um, while discovery is currently the biggest challenge when it comes to IIIF, um, Benjamin Alberton from Stanford has assembled this great list to get us started. So we can actually take a look uh, here at some of these collections. Uh, there's also a browser plugin for finding IIIF manifests. So for those of you who are interested in finding IIIF content, uh, this is a great place to start, particularly this bit.ly link. Um, here, it's a community resource. It's something that's being added to. You can see it, the last, it was last updated in September, 2020, but it gives a whole list of IIIF consortium members as well as non-consortium members that are participating in IIIF compliance, various different aggregators, um, IIIF data resources, and events that are uh, in coordination with these types of resources. I have a question. Oh yes, by all means. Are there similar resources for um, for video? Great question. Or uh, is there any way to get um, video things into a service like Mirador? So the only thing that I can think of right now is Scalar. Are you familiar with Scalar out of USC? No. Um, so the Scalar platform, it's not a IIIF platform. It's um, a sort of something that's, it's a content management, management system similar to uh, Omeka. Um, let me just quickly. So 
So Scalar is really great. Um, I highly recommend taking a look at some of their examples. They recently came out with um, a whole publishing side of their platform to add in an editorial line, um, which is really great. So it, they're thinking about peer review publications. They've done a number of multimedia um, sort of presentations. Another, um, there's one other content management system, oh, Manifold. For you. Can you, oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, um, can you drop all these into the chat? Yes, of course. Okay. And this is being recorded, right? This is being recorded. Will yes. it be made available to us? It will be um, through our, our EDRI YouTube channel, which is linked in my slides at the very beginning. Um, so Manifold is another great uh, community and platform. I highly recommend you take a look at their services. They also have sort of feature publications. I've seen a great uh, like video game, or I should say gaming publications that have come out of uh, scholarship on gaming that's come out of Manifold. So let me put that in the chat for you. Having all kinds of issues today. Is that a is that an a UCLA available resource, or do we have to purchase it? So right now, Manifold is run through. I'm sorry, I'm having an issue with my chat. One second. So Manifold is run through a university. They have their own publishing wing that's connected to Manifold, but you can also. Um, have local instances of Manifold. So UCLA could, in theory, set it up. Um, Is it possible to request that? I believe so. I can talk with the library, actually, to see if there's anything already happening. I know that we've talked with uh, the California Library about setting up an instance. Mm -hmm. um, they've done some other projects with Manifold and um, we're eager to get started with maybe partnering on UCLA work. So there's a, a number of different options there and I'm happy to follow up with you after the workshop on that. Thank you. But great questions. Um, so along those lines, UCLA is investing in making our special collections material IIIF compatible, which is incredibly exciting. We now have our own instance of Mirador, which you're free to use uh, in your research or your classrooms. Uh, and you can find that here. So it's just like the Mirador that we have been looking at before, but now we've got um, our sort of own plain instance that you can populate and play around with. Um, so the Mirador, workspace, right, for UCLA is available here. We also have the digital collections that are being set up as Mirador compliant. Um, and so as I mentioned earlier, you can bring resources in as a collection and I wanna briefly demonstrate that now. So this is the Cashin collection that is just the coolest. And I'm gonna take you to the collections page at first. So what we can do here is we can actually bring in this manifest URL and I am really hoping that I'm not gonna run into another issue here. So what we're gonna do, <laughs> we're gonna try this one more time and we're gonna bring this over and I'm going to actually copy this URL um, I'm going to take it out of my notes directly because I just don't want to run into any more issues. Um, but again, you have to adjust that link and add the manifest.json on the end of it, um, right? And say add. I'm going to give it a minute. It should load. It's a fairly large collection. You can see it has 6,000 items in it. Um, 
But once that's loaded, you can choose which items you want to load individually from the collection. So if I click on this, right, um, I can actually show collection. I have all these different listings, so I can pick which one and actually see these beautiful illustrations in this fashion collection. And if I want to add more, right, I can go back to add here and I can see that that link is still there, that resource is still there. So if I click on that, I get to pick again. Maybe this time I wanna look at um, to address, right? So we can start to compare out of this beautiful collection. Um, the library would welcome any feedback about how they can make their collections more usable and useful. So please feel free to email me. I can put you in touch with any of them um, if you have thoughts or questions about how to make these digital resources that we have at UCLA available and usable for your research. Okay. So the other challenging bit at the moment um, well, this is my slide about moving from Mirador 2 to 3. So sometimes you'll find resources still staged in Mirador 2 rather than Mirador 3, um, since the switchover is still in progress. Not all institutions have changed or switched over yet. Uh, for example, the Getty Museum collections are still running Mirador 2, but I can still bring over those resources into Mirador 3. To do that, we just need to make sure that we're copying over the correct part of the resource link. So if we go to the collection at the Getty and that link you can find in my presentation slides, so this is for Toulouse-Lautrec's um, work, we can click on the triple IF icon for the resource and we'll be taken to a Mirador 2 instance with that work. And from there, we wanna copy the back part of the URL, starting with manifest uh, equal sign. And once we get that second half there, we paste that into our Mirador 3 instance in order to add it. What I think most of you are here for is how to host your own version of Mirador. Um, now, part one of this workshop, I'm gonna show you how to get a quick and easy personal setup of Mirador going, and we'll do a more in-depth installation in part two, where we pull from Git, and I'll sort of give you an example of that at the very, very tail end of the workshop. Um, but for now, we're gonna do something that's actually relatively quick and pretty easy and useful if you just wanna get something up and running to be able to share with people. So first go to, again, Mirador, projectmirador.org where we have been before. This should look familiar. Paste that in the chat again. And you're gonna scroll down to the GitHub page um, or you're gonna click on code, sorry. There we go, click on code first, and then scroll down the GitHub page where you see Mirador start glitch. So this is an instance that we're actually gonna be able to pull from and use for ourselves. Is everybody able to follow along there and access that? I'm gonna copy that link for people just to make sure. In case you need it yourself. Okay. So, right, you've scrolled down the GitHub page and you've selected mirrored or start. I'm sorry, um, yeah. Once you're there, you're gonna be able to get started with Glitch. Let me get rid of this page. Um, 
So Glitch is a great free platform for learning, testing, and sharing code. I highly recommend it. I discovered it not too long ago. Sorry, printer's going off. Um, and I've really become obsessed with it for any kind of coding class, being able to share uh, coding with people that I'm collaborating with. It's really useful. So I'm gonna show you two different ways that we can embed Mirador into a Google site. And if you haven't used Google Sites before, it is a website building platform that is built into the G Suite set of tools. Um, so more on that in a minute. But first, using the FISH logo in the upper right-hand corner, we have two different options, but let's start by clicking on View Source. So we're gonna go to these FISH icons and we're gonna click on View Source. We'll give it a second to load. Okay, so what we see here in this setup is that we ha now have a working environment that shows us our files on the left. What's in those files is in the middle. And then how they're rendered on the web is here on the right. So as you can see in uh, this is really useful for any type of web development. And if you can um, sign in using either your Google account or your GitHub account or any other account, you can use a regular email if you want, which it just may take a minute or two to register for Glitch uh, if you're not going to connect through your Google um, or GitHub. But we're going to remix this code. So you can see here, remix to edit. Um, but you don't actually have to. Um, sign in, in in order to see this code, right? You can actually access it from here, which is really great. You can see all inside all the files and you can see how they render here on the left. I can adjust these windows so you can get a better sense over here. We have a lot of different options. So um, now remixing code basically means that you copy it into your own account on Glitch and that way you can do whatever you want to it and not affect the original code. If you just want a plain mirror door environment, start, you can start by navigating to this index file, right? And then copying that entire text. So if you just want a plain like instance, what you see right here, that's what you can do. But we wanna populate ours with things that are meaningful you know, to us and our research. So let's actually remix to edit. I'm signed in currently, but you can sign in via whatever your account. So I'll, I'll quickly sign out so we can, I can show you what that looks like. Um, so again, you can log in, you can sign up. And when you sign up, you can access it through any of these accounts um, or you can email yourself a magic link. So you have options here. I'm gonna go with my Google account. You can see there's things while we're waiting. Um, now I've actually already made some edits. Um, it's remembering that I, <laughs> that I was here before and I made some edits, but I'm gonna show us how to do that uh, in just a second here. So let's actually, and go back to show you from scratch. Okay, so mirror door start. Remix on glitch. Okay, so here's a fresh remix version that we're going to be able to edit ourselves now because we've remixed it, we've signed into our own account, and we can now access these files and actually make changes. Um, so in this case, we want to edit the code. And we can see here there's essentially two, 
two instances of Mirador on top of one another. So we've got a plain instance up here and we've got a pre-populated instance down here. Now the reason why they did this is so that they can show us how we can pre-populate our own instance of Mirador. But we don't really need two, we just want one that's pre-populated. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna navigate down here to see this division ID where it says Mirador 2. Mirador 2 essentially is just marking the fact that this is a second instance of Mirador in this page. Um, and what we're gonna do is we're going to substitute one of our resources into here. Now, remember that manifest ID, that link? That's what we wanna use. So I'm gonna, again, use one of these from the UCLA library. So I've just copied that out of my notes in my PowerPoint. So you can use that one, or you can find another UCLA library resource that you want to use from that list that I provided you with. Um, and you can paste it. Now we notice at the end, right, we don't have that manifest.json. So we're going to add that in. And voila, we scroll down. We now see that the cat has turned into a lady with some ski poles. Um, and we don't actually want these windows down below, but we want to move them up here and we wanna get rid of the second instance. So the way that we do that is we're going to copy this entire row from windows down to this closed bracket. Because what we're doing is we're just gonna replace, see how it, these um, slashes indicate that these are comments within our code that we have here. And essentially that's just notes left over by whoever programmed this to let us know a little bit about the code that we're looking at. So in this case, we can see it says, look, you can open up Mirador windows. So we know that this is the set of code that allows us to open up those many different windows and populate them with the manifest IDs or the resources that we want to, to be shown. So I'm gonna copy just this set of information. And I know I can recognize that the structure is the same in this division and in this second division, right? They're very similar. I've got script text, right? And then I've got this section where it says ID Mirador, ID, and this is Mirador 2. So we want to do it under this ID Mirador just like it is here. So we're just going to, we don't actually need these comments. So we're going to replace those comments with our windows from before. And when we do that, we see these things get loaded here to the left. Now we have basically two instances on top of one another, right? And we really only want one. So we can go ahead and delete that second instance. So basically everything from div down to script, all of that can go because we don't need it anymore. So now, can see we just have this instance and that looks good that's what we want right now we could remove this stuff up at the top if you don't want the introduction or anything like that um, it's really up to you and basically at this point what we're going to do is we're going to copy this entire index and then we're going to create a Google slide. I'm sorry, a Google site. Now, to create a Google site, you can either um, navigate to your G Suite, either through email or however. And when you do, you're going to see these 
this menu item here up at the top on the right hand side of your screen of your browser. And when you click on that, you'll get different things that you can open, right? Different applications in the G Suite that you can open and you can navigate to Google Sites. If you don't see it, you may have to scroll to the bottom um, for, I think it says more from Google Workspace Marketplace and locate it within that extended list. Or you can simply go to sites.google.com um, and that should automatically launch your Google Sites, if you and you may have to log in, but that should should get you there. Um, does anybody need help with that? I'm not going to copy and paste that over because I well, I can always go back and copy. So here, let me let me just do that real fast so everybody can have that in your chat. And I should say before we start with Google Sites. Are there any questions about Glitch and what we've done here in Glitch and moving around the code? I'm sort of assuming that people have a basic familiarity with code. Um, if you don't, that's fine. As long as you're following along, it's really a plug and play um, where you're just sort of switching things out to make sure that you have your resources in the right place. Um, so once we're in Google Sites, we can add a blank instance, right? And you can start an entirely new Google Site. You can name your site. I'm gonna call this Mirador2 since I have already had uh, an example one created, Mirador2, but you can call it Mirador1 or you can call it whatever you want. Um, and it's really a WYSIWYG environment. So again, it's what you see is what you get. Um, you can add a title to your site and you can add logos and it's pretty straightforward. Um, what we're gonna do now is we're going to use this embed feature under insert in the menu here on the right to add our code from Glitch. So I'm gonna go back to Glitch and I'm gonna copy this code again to make sure that I have it. And we're going to paste that in to the embed using the embed feature. So rather than by URL, we're going to say embed code because we actually have code and it says HTML code goes here. Simple enough, right? So we'll paste that code out of Glitch into our Google site and we'll press save. See that it's working, it's thinking about it. And now we see our windows and we can say insert. Now it sort of pasted in a little squished. We can actually adjust that so it takes up most of the page down to lengthen it out a little bit. Right. So now we have our own pre-populated Mirador instance in a website, which we will be able to publish and share with others. Um, any hiccups with that embed? Everybody do okay with that? Okay, so now we're going to embed the whole Mirador Glitch environment into our website, just to demonstrate another option. You can keep your Google Site tab open and in another tab, go back to the Mirador Start Glitch dot me URL. So I'll paste that again into the chat. We're just going to go back to that original sort of location here. And when we were in that location, we were able to choose between a few different options. And in this case, we're going to try the embed this app option. So when we get there, we have this set of code that comes up. 
that we're just going to highlight and copy again for ourselves. And the way that I'm copying um, is Control C or Command C if you're on a Mac, uh, Control C if you're on a PC. And then I'm just going to bring that back over to our Google site. Now, when we're in our Google site, we're going to add a page rather than do it on the same page, just to teach us a little bit more about how to use Google Sites. We're gonna to go to Pages, and we're gonna go down to the bottom here where you can add a new link or a new page. And we're gonna add a new page, and we'll call this Embedded Glitch. And now, we're on that page and we can move from pages to insert and do basically the same thing that we just did for the home page. Um, we're going to go to embed. We're going to switch to embed code and we're going to paste in that embed this app code and click next. Give it a minute, but now we see it's got actually a frame around it, and it's quite literally the web page from Glitch that people can access. But they can work with that environment now directly in our website if we wanted them to be able to, right? So this is just two different options of how you can create a more personalized version of Mirador or bring it into your own environments to make it work for you. Um, I'm gonna quickly show you how to now publish your Google site and that way you can share it with others. So when you're here in the Google site, back to home if we wanted to write to see our personalized instance. If we want to publish, the upper right hand corner, we press that button. It'll ask us what we want the URL address to be, the web address to be. It's always going to be sites.google.com slash if you're at UCLA, it'll be your UCLA um, Google site and then it'll be whatever you want to place at the end here. Um, I'm going to go with Mirador 2, that's fine. You can also then manage who sees it. So I'm going to adjust that management. Um, so I can make it public, I can share it with others. Um, I can change who can see it. So I'm going to make this public so that everybody can see it so I can share it with everybody. Um, but you can keep it restricted. Um, I always keep my drafts res restricted, so until I'm ready to publish, it's you know, no one else can see it. And then I'll say done. And you can also request if you want public search engines to display your page or not. In this case, no one needs to see this, so I'm not going to, but if you're actually building something in Google Sites and you want people to be able to find it more easily, it's always great to expose it to public search engines. So now it says my site has been published. Now it looks, it doesn't look any different, um, but that's because we're actually still in the back end here. Uh, to preview your site, you can always check this little laptop mobile icon here up at the top. That will give you an example of what your site will look like uh, on a laptop, on an iPad, um, or on an iPhone. Um, so not the greatest embed for iPhone and iPad in this case, um, but perfectly fine on a laptop, right? And when I wanna share it with somebody now that it's published, this link will allow me to copy and paste it and see the forward facing version of my website. Now I, because I'm logged in and I'm the owner, I have this little um, edit icon down at the bottom, but no one else will see that but me. So if I 
copy and paste that into the chat. You all should be able to access that and take a look and see this instance of Mirador in your own web browsers. And you also should be able to interact with it in much the same way, right? So if people need to add a resource and that sort of thing. Oh, okay, because we set it, that's actually preset. There we go. So now we can, we can interact with it like they did before. Um, so we can also take a look at the embedded glitch page and we can see that that whole instance of Mirador is now embedded into our Google site. We can start, we can add resources, much in the same way that we would be able to do on the Glitch site. So, but we have control over it now um, in our page. Any questions about that before we move forward? I know we're sort of running out of time, so I'm gonna actually move ahead now to just a few final things. There are many possibilities of how you can use these types of tools. And I just wanna briefly highlight one that may be of interest to those of you who are working with transcriptions. So from the page is a IIIF based um, project and you can use it as a guest or make your own project. Benjamin uh, from Stanford again, created a set of instructions for getting started in one of his other tutorials, which is linked in my notes here. So we can actually take a look at that. So you can sign up for an account. Uh, I think you might wanna try running a class sourced or crowdsourced project. You can use the start free trial option um, and you can start your own project if you want load in objects, determine the level of participation that you want for your project, determine any transcription guidelines that you want to set, and determine the editorial process. I'm just going to briefly jump into from the page and show you what this project is all about. So if we go to find a project, and I'm just signed in as guest right now, but you can actually log in and participate in different projects and this is constantly changing, so we'll see what we get here in the just randomized project. So you can pick from these works in this case, and you can actually, so these are completed already. Let's find a project that isn't completed. A lot, of, a lot of ones from, from changing. Mm -hmm. Oh, damn it. Here we go. I had been in this one a little while ago. Um, so in this case, see this one has been started, but people aren't working on it. So you can actually help out and you can jump in and find something that's incomplete. And you can actually participate. Um, you can add notes. Um, in some cases, you can actually correct, yeah, in this case. And these are all different depending on the project. Um, you can see previous versions. So all of this is adjusted based on the project. Um, so if we've had a different project, just to showcase some different examples. Um, so here we can see there's a side-by-side -side view and you're able to just transcribe one-to-one. -one. And then when you're done, you click save and you can also have check needs review so that somebody who's an expert in the project can come through and actually check your work. So this is one way that 
IIIF is being used for transcription and an easy sort of platform that's already set up to do this kind of trans transcription work if you're interested in doing a project like that. Um, the other thing that I want to mention is annotations. So again, the switch from Mirador 2 to 3 has changed some of the, the ways that the annotation tools are working. Um, but fear not, I've got an example here for us to test it out. Um, though the annotations won't be savable other than in this particular workspace, but it sort of lets you see what the functionality is. And in an upcoming workshop, we'll be able to, the second iteration of this workshop, I'll be able to show you how to get a local instance of this set up on your own machine. So um, if everyone navigates to the link I just dropped in the chat, you'll notice that under the image window that pops up already, right, the image sidebar, toggle sidebar, that now in the annotation section, we have this additional create new annotation button. And we can click that and get access to a whole toolbar to create our own annotations. We can use the arrow selection and choose a shape that we want to use to create an annotation location. Um, if I want to switch where that annotation is, maybe I didn't mean to do this eye, I meant to do the other eye. I have to actually switch to this uh, sort of square icon over here to move the annotation. Um, otherwise, if I stay on the selection target pointer, then I'll create a new annotation. But once I'm here, I can also style that annotation, so for the line of the annotation. So if I wanted to change this to purple um, and make it a thicker line, I can also fill in the back if I wanted to. Um, so if I created a new annotation with that style, now I can do here, right? And I can add text. So I can bold that text, I can italicize that text, but I can type test annotation and I can say save. And now we see that it's gone from five to six annotations. And my test annotation shows up here. So I can see their annotations and then I can see my annotations. So, um, It's a great way to be able to just demonstrate what the functionality of annotations will look like in Mirador. I'm working on what will be a follow-up video or second workshop to demonstrate how you might easily set up an annotation server in connection with a local instance so that your annotations can be more permanently saved. And if that's what you're interested in, um, please do let me know in the chat. Um, it's great to have some direction for those types of you know, things, developing those workshops. Um, but for now, this environment will save your annotations here. But if you export them um, or export the JSON, as we do to transfer workspaces, the annotations will not be present because they're not stored in the JSON. Uh, the JSON. Um, in the meantime, though, I thought I'd briefly walk you through, we'll end a little early, um, how you can get a local instance up and running as sort of a preview. Um, since you'll need to be able to do a number of installs and get annotation and annotation server set up. So this is just a sort of peek into what will be part two of this workshop. Um, I'll jump back over to slides. So in the next workshop, we'll clone Mirador from GitHub. We'll download Visual Code Studio, which is an environment for working on code locally and then being able to push it to things like um,
GitHub or GitHub pages so that it can be presented online. Um, we'll install the Mirador dependencies. So there's a number of different things that need to be installed in order to get Mirador up and running on your local instance. Um, and hopefully with a local annotation server option as well. There's been a number of um, different annotation options, uh, server options. A local instance would probably be ideal. Otherwise you have to probably use a database service or um, set up a, a database connection, which is a little more in depth than maybe some people wanna go, but it's good to know. So definitely let me know in the chat if that's what you're looking for. Um, this though felt like a lot to do straight out the gate. So I figured we save it for part two of this workshop. Um, just quickly, I will show you uh, an example in Visual Studio Code. I'll bring that over so you see that right here, right? Once you get this environment set up and you download, you pull from Git, you'll be able to have essentially your own working space with the files. And you'll be able to initialize. So let me see if I, I may have already initialized, it may not need me to do it again. But I can navigate to my local instance in my browser. Yes. So, I've already initialized the dependencies and you can see it's not public, it's private, it's just running off of my local files, but I've got an example of Mirador. So for those of you who are asking, can you use your own images in Mirador? This would be the way to do it. So once you have a local instance sort of set up, you can actually, uh, I think you're able to use your own local files within the working environment. Um, but I will double check on that just to make sure that I'm pretty sure that that way you can actually have any kind of image file um, be accessible within Mirador and you can compare and contrast so that that can be pushed publicly. Um, with that, I think I will leave it there for today. Hopefully this gives you a few ideas on how you might start using IIIF APIs and the Mirador Viewer in your own work. Um, just let me know if there's any questions and thank you all for sticking around. I hope this was useful.